Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, Making Friends for God, The Joy of Sharing in His Mission. I always want to emphasize that, His Mission. We share in His Mission. And this particular lesson is number 11, entitled, Sharing the Story of Jesus. That ought to be great and excitement for every Christian, shouldn't it? Anyway, it's the lesson for September 12 of 2020. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have come here to enjoy learning more about you and thinking about how we can better share uh, the wonderful truths we believe about your life and your death and all that it should mean for us. Be with us as we discuss that today, that we may represent you correctly is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, the famous poet Edgar Guest once said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Okay. So, witnessing. Let's, be, let's get some things very clear. Witnessing is not picking an argument over theology. That's not, the, that's not witnessing. Witnessing is telling what Jesus has done for us and for others. So it has to be just us personally. It is sharing what we know about Jesus. It is not trying to prove what we believe is right or what someone else might believe is wrong, we might believe is wrong. A life lived following the pattern of Jesus Christ is the most powerful argument that can be given in favor, favor of the gospel. We call that Christianity. In at least two different places, Paul talked about what happens when a person is converted. Paul's own personal testimony, of course, is found in Acts 26, the, his most extensive uh, telling of that. However, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, reveals basically the same ideas. Lives that were dead in trespasses and sin, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, have been changed until they are exceedingly rich with His grace. Life takes on new meaning. Jo as John declared, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men, John 1, 4. There have been many arguments down through the generations about whether or not we can be saved by keeping the commandments. I think we could all remember the days when that was argued by somebody. Keeping any set of commandments is not the way to salvation. Might be a good idea, but it's not the way to salvation. Salvation comes through a trusting relationship we call faith with Jesus Christ. That involves an active daily searching for better ways to copy his life, but it is also true that faith works. Notice we said faith works. You have faith first, and if you have that relationship with Jesus Christ, it works. We keep God's commandments because we have faith and are saved, not in order to be saved. Let's make sure we keep that sequence in the right order. So what does that change say to you about God? Is the good news apparent in your actions? Think about what Jesus said in John 13, 34, and 35. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. That's uh. from the Good News Translation, American Bible Society. Now I want you to think about the way these words were first heard by the disciples. They were in the upper room. They didn't know it, but this is their last night with Jesus. And he said, I'm giving you a new commandment. You must love one another. And they were familiar enough with the Old Testament. They were about, I'm sure they would have said, that's not a new commandment. That's in Leviticus. Why are you saying that? But then he said, as I have loved you, so you must love it. Oh boy. Now that's a whole new level. Okay, as I have loved you, you must love one another. That's another level. 
And then he goes on to say, if you have love, if you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. In other words, we ought to actually live as if we like Jesus, as if we, we want to be like Jesus. And, and I'm sure if they weren't still thinking about who's going to be prime minister, when that came along, they must have thought, whoa, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a whole other level. So what does this say to us about the challenge, the change that happens when we really become one of Christ's faithful disciples or followers? Do those words describe you? Does everyone around you know that you are a Christian, that you're a disciple of Christ? I cannot just stay quiet on this yeah. one. Sorry to burn it. Speak up. Um, I'm just, you know, when a Christian brother takes another brother to court in a Muslim country, when a Seventh-day Adventist does it, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not speaking whatever. Mm -hmm. It's happening right now. I could thinking of case, you know, not only one, several of them involving the, the president of the union. Yeah. Ah. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciple. Yeah. If you love one another. It's sad. Yeah. That must be in context of the way the rest of the world operates. Yeah. You, they Has stand out as, as a witness. Because, yeah. they, uh, of course, remember Jesus says, I came that you can have joy and you can have joy now. Mm -hmm. That ought to help give you a, a new perspective on things for yeah. some people anyway. Exactly. Well, let's look at some examples. James and John, the two disciples, possibly cousins of Jesus. There's some some hints of that in, in the names in the, in the Gospels, were also known as Sons of Thunder. <laughs> now, I don't know how they got that title, but <laughs> it doesn't sound by, like being loving and kind and gentle, does it? Wasn't this the time when uh, they were not accepted in the village? And no, that, that, no, this is a separate time. We're going to talk about that one in just okay. a moment. There are several references in the New Testament to suggest that they were ready to call fire down on people, and that's right. the one you're talking about. Let's look at that for a second. Luke 9, 54. When the disciples James and John saw this, this, being re, the, the, this group of Samaritans said, no, you can't stay in, our, in our, our town. You're on your way to Jerusalem. They said, Lord, do you want us to fall, call fire down from heaven to destroy them? <laughs> And, of course, they were referring to what? That's the exact place where this would be now 750 years earlier, Elijah had called fire down on groups of soldiers that had been sent out to kill him. Oh, man. He said, here's the very spot. Do we want us to do it again? Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then Jesus and his disciples went on to another village. Wow. Um, they wanted to stop people from performing miracles in the name of Jesus unless they were his disciples. Think about that. But a transformation came in their lives, especially the life of John, of course, because James was killed very early in the history of the, of the Christian church. John was the younger of the two, and what do we know about him? Charles, I think that's yours. In the life of the disciple John, John, true sanctification is exemplified. During the years of his chose, close association with Christ, he was often warned and cautioned by the Savior, and these reproof, reproofs he accepted. As the character of the Divine One was manifested to John, he saw his own deficiencies and was humbled by the revelation. Day by day, in contrast with his own violent spirit, he beheld the tenderness and forbearance of Jesus and heard his lessons of humility and patience. Day by day, his heart was drawn out of Christ until he lost sight of self in love for his master. The power and the tenderness, the majesty and meekness, the strength and patience that he saw in the daily life of the Son of God filled his soul with admiration. 
he yielded his resentful, ambitious temper to the molding power of Christ and divine love wrought in him a transformation of character. Ellen White, beautiful, beautiful. Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, uh, by page 555, 57, paragraph 1. And then yet the next little one there. By beholding him, we become changed into his divine likeness. Ellen White, Reuben Herald, January 18, 1881, paragraph 4. Wow. Wow. By Peter. beholding him. How do we behold Jesus? Read, study, listen. Mm -hmm. Just yep. like John did, the paragraph before. Mm -hmm. Jesus is a teacher. Yep. Father is a teacher. Spirit is teacher. It, it, it is clear. Uh, we could just pick some verses. Let me, let me read these. We write to you about the word of life which has existed from the very beginning. We have heard it. We have seen it with our eyes. Yes, we have seen it and our hands have touched it. When, of course, remember, this is in the days when some people were challenging the idea whether Jesus mm -hmm. was really human. When this life became visible, we saw it. So we speak of it and tell you about the eternal life which was with the Father and was made known to us. What we have seen and heard we announce to you also so that you will join with us in the fellowship that we have with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this in order that our joy may be complete. So what's he saying? We are happy. We're filled with joy because we had the opportunity to experience this individual in our lives. Well, John recognized a very clear distinction between those who knew God and were transformed versus those who did not know God and were people of this world. True disciples or children of God not only love God supremely, but also their neighbors as themselves. They also obey God's commandments. But we must not try to use force to convince people of the gospel. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. That's in The Desire of Ages, page two, excuse me, page 22. Mm -hmm. The badge of Christianity is not an outward sign not the wearing of a cross or a crown, but is that which reveals the union of man with God. By the power of his grace manifested in the transformation of character, the world is to be convinced that God has sent his Son as its Redeemer. No other influence that can surround the human soul has such power as the influence of an unselfish life. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. Wow. Ministry of Healings, 470. Unselfish life there, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. Do we see that manifested in our world today? Just lots of it here and there everywhere? No, I'm. It's been said if there were only predators, soon there would cease to be any predators. Yeah. But if there were, you know, not, not the whole world is not but a bunch of bad people. Yeah. But there's an awful lot of bad people that are making it tough for, yeah, for the rest. rest. Well, Jesus made three so-called missionary journeys during his, which he sent, during which, I'm sorry, he sent his disciples out to practice their skills in Galilee. And the first and second missionary journeys, he took the disciples with him, and they learned of him before he sent them out on their own on their third missionary journey. He also sent out other missionaries. Those missionaries were not from among the disciples. They were not even among his longtime followers. The first missionaries he sent out on their own were the former demoniacs, Gentiles from the region of Perea on the other side of Jordan of Galilee. They had been with Jesus only a few hours, but the power of Jesus had caused an enormous change in their lives. And let's just look at that really quick. Uh, hold on here just a second. 
Mm. Yeah, okay. When Jesus came to the territory of Gadara on the other side of the lake, he was met with two men who came out of the burial caves there. These men had demons in them and were so fierce that no one dared travel on that road. At once they screamed, What what do you want with us, you son of God? Have you you know, that's a that's a nice thing to say about somebody, you son <laughs> of God. We unfortunately hear other kinds of definite other mm -hmm. kinds of expressions. Have you come to punish us before the right time? Not far away there was a large herd of pigs feeding. So the demons begged Jesus, if you're going to drive us out, send us into that herd of pigs and and you know the rest of the story here. We're gonna uh, talk about it a little bit. Here yes. here the demons are saying that there is a day of judgment. How could some Christians, many Christians say there's nothing called judgment? Of course, we who have accepted him, judgment has already Okay, we're not we we're actually judgment. we judge God. Oh that's right. Yeah, it it's not so. it's not God judging us. Yeah. He says he doesn't and it, but he does say that the words he has spoken now must be in the past is going to be our judge. Right. But he doesn't. We, we actually heaven is self-selected. Mm. God doesn't select us for heaven. We choose what everyone will be there. God right. doesn't even close the probation. No. He closes probation when everyone here on this earth has made up their mind. Yeah. That's the, that's what it says. That's what Ellen White says very specifically. Well, the interchange between Jesus and those demoniacs was quite remarkable. He, or they, were full of demons. There's, Matthew suggests that there were two of them, and Mark suggests just one, so, but there are probably two, but one was probably more prominent than the other. And when Jesus cast the demons out, he allowed them to go into a herd of pigs, which rushed down the hillside and drowned in the Sea of Galilee. And just to do a little trivia on the side, if you were a very conservative Jew and you knew that 2,000 pigs had just drowned in the Sea of Galilee, <laughs> would you drink the water? <laughs> or eat the fish. <laughs> or, or, or eat the fish, yeah, even eat the fish. <laughs> I, I, I have to chuckle every time I think about that. Oh boy. But weren't the owners Jews themselves that somewhere we get that notion? Hold on, we're, we're oh, getting there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Dan, is it? Who, where are we? Thank you. Um, Matthew 8. Okay. Maybe it's either you or me. I think you were going to do that one. That's okay. All right. Go ahead, Jim. Go, Jesus told them, so they left and went off into the pigs. The whole herd rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. The men who had been taking care of the pigs ran away and went into the town where they told the whole story and what had happened to the men with the demons. So everyone from the town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their territory. Okay. Mark 5, is that mine? He let them go, and the evil, this, is, this is Mark's version of the story. He let them go, and the evil spirits went out of the man and entered the pigs. The whole herd, about 2,000 pigs in all, rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. The men who had been taking care of the pigs ran away and spread the news in the town among the farms. People went out to see what had happened. I'm sure it was the most crazy thing that had happened there in a long time, so everybody wanted to know about it. So this former demoniac, and he probably had a companion if you believe Matthew's version of the story, was the first Gentile missionary. Would we have chosen him? There was no formal education, was there? I mean, by the devil. Yeah. I but, mean, the devil is the one who's been leading his life so far. But he, he, the guy didn't have a, a scriptures probably no. to study. All he had good had is witness yeah. of his experience. There are two very important things to know about this story, which very few people know. So we're going to share those with you. These two men had an enormous impact on that mostly Gentile area, as Ellen White explained. Though the people of Gergesa had not received Jesus, he did not leave them to the darkness they had chosen. When they bade him depart from them, they had not heard his words. They were ignorant of that which they were rejecting. Therefore he again sent the light to them and by, by those to whom they would not refuse to listen. 
and causing the destruction of the swine, it was Satan's purpose to turn the people away from the Savior and prevent the preaching of the gospel in that region. But this very occurrence roused the whole country as nothing else could have done and directed attention to Christ. Though the Savior himself departed, the men whom he had healed remained as witnesses to his power. Those who had been mediums of the Prince of Darkness became channels of light, messengers of the Son of God. Men marveled as they listened to the wondrous news. A door was opened to the gospel throughout that region. And again, I'd like to stop and ask you all to think about this for a moment. If you knew that there was a, a, a road or even an area close to where you live, nobody dared to go there because there were a couple of de demon-possessed people lived there and they just beat to pieces, maybe even killed somebody who went there. And all of a sudden, here are those same people and they're in your town and they're leading a big group of people and talking about what wonderful things Jesus had done for them. I mean, how would you respond? I mean, think about it. When Jesus returned to Decapolis, the people flocked about him. And for three days, not merely the inhabitants of one town, but thousands from all the surrounding region heard the message of salvation, even the power of demons is under the control of our Savior and the working of evil is overruled for good. Desire of Ages 340, paragraph 2 and 3. And at the end of that period, they, when they were all hungry, what happened? Do you remember? Jesus fed them. Jesus fed them. He fed the Gentiles, 4,000 men, not counting women and children. So this was the, this was the, I mean, if you want to know if people came out to hear him, uh, we're talking 15,000 people or something that came out to hear him because of whose testimony? One crazy man. One or two crazy men. Well, they're not crazy anymore. That's right. <laughs> Question. Um, how far is Decapolis from Jerusalem? About, uh, well, remember, about. now that's, that, that's an impossible question because Decapolis is ten towns and one, yeah, of, right. them is, okay. one of them is down even south of Jerusalem. And, uh, yeah, one is even south of Jerusalem, I believe, and the highest one goes way up almost in Deba it's Damascus. Kind of so it's a whole, I guess it would be this way for you. Right, okay. It's a whole line of them like this. So right. it's... Okay, understood. Um, you're thinking about the crucifixion weekend. If this very folk if it was today's and it was in the news, I want to think that there would be trouble. Mm -hmm. That these guys would come, no, you cannot do this. I think, I want to think that people from Tyre and Sidon mm -hmm. would come down 200 they miles did. away. Oh, they did, yeah. They did, absolutely. There were people from Syria came down for healing and to hear Jesus. Yeah. It was the most exciting thing that was going on in the whole area. Oh, absolutely. But I'm thinking about the crucifixion weekend. Oh, oh the crucifixion. I'm sorry. Yeah. Had they known this, what was going on? Yes, there were probably a million people in there, but these were all from other areas. They all did, see, it, so. they did it in the darkness. Remember? That's right. That's the whole point. They had to do it under, under right, the right. cover of darkness. That's the whole point. Yes. And remember that more people came to Pentecost. I'm sorry. It's the opposite of what I want to say. More people normally came to Passover than to Pentecost. Right. And we know at Pentecost there were people from just about every language group in the world. So there were even more at the, more at, at the time of, of Passover. And also this mob, the frenzy, what we we're seeing today. <laughs> is it the, uh, some good people says, no, I, it's scary. I'm not going to go there. Or who, who knows? They, uh, even the disciples didn't think that they, they would be hanging to the cross. Right. But how? Okay. How it went. Who's next? Uh, Terry. Uh, but the purposes of Christ were not thwarted. He allowed the evil spirits to destroy the herd of swine as a rebuke to those Jews who were raising these unclean beasts for the sake of gain. Let's stop there for a second. Here's a group of Jews, some, a few probably, who were raising pigs not to eat themselves, but to, to sell to their, to their pagan neighbors, their Gentile neighbors, for a profit. Well, you know, in Israel now, the many Israeli, Israelis sell weapons to the Palestinians. 
you know, they get a bunch of money over it. You know, they, 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 nothing motivates like greed. Yeah. And that's human nature down yeah. to the millennia. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kerry. Had not Christ restrained the demons, they would have plunged into the sea, not only the swine, but also their keepers and owners. The preservation of both the keepers and owners was due alone to his power, mercifully exercised for their deliverance. Mm. Furthermore, this event was permitted to take place that the disciples might witness the cruel power of Satan upon both man and beast. Mm. The Savior desired his followers to have a knowledge of the foe whom they were to meet, that they might not be deceived and overcome by his devices. It was also his will that the people of that region should behold his power to break the bondage of Satan and release his captives. And though Jesus himself departed, the men so marvelously delivered remained to declare the mercy of their benefactor. And that's from The Great Controversy, page 515, paragraph 1. Do you think that these men somehow got word that Jesus was, later when Jesus came back, did they have an idea that he was going to be there, and so they said, oh, come and see the man who, who transformed us? Who did this? Who, who, who got the word that Jesus was coming back? Well, what happened to these men? What did the townspeople find when they went to see what had happened? Would we have chosen him or them? There are two very important things to know about the story that few know. For a few moments, only these men had been privileged to hear the teachings of Christ. Not one sermon from his lips had ever fallen upon their ears. They could not instruct the people as the disciples who had been daily with Christ were able to do. But they bore in their own persons the evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. They could tell what they knew, what they themselves had seen, heard, and felt, the power of Christ. This is what everyone can do whose heart has been touched by the grace of God. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 340, paragraph 1. Marvelous, Marvelous books. If you have not read Desire of Ages, or if you have not read it even recently, it's time to get it out. That book is full of so much. It's, it's been recommended by, um, you, uh, by university presidents. The demoniacs became new men transformed by the power of Christ. The townspeople found them sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to every word from the Master's mouth. We should note that Mas Matthew's Gospel says that there were two demoniacs delivered while Mark's Gospel focuses his story on only one of the two. However, the point is, Jesus restored them physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Mm. Obviously, the changed demoniac, this new convert, wanted to stay with Jesus. But what did Jesus tell him to do? Mark 5, 18 to 20. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had had the demons begged him, Let me go with you. But Jesus would not let him. Instead, he told him, Go back home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how kind he has been to you. So the man left, went through the ten towns, telling what Jesus had done for him, and all who heard it were amazed." Wow. Their testimonies prepared Decapolis, the ten cities, on, on, by the way, Decapolis is just the Greek for ten cities, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee to receive the teachings of Jesus. This is the power of personal testimony. In addition to all that we have seen that resulted from the witness of this, this or these one or two demons, demoniacs, we need to note that when the Christians, following the instructions of Jesus, Matthew, let's just look at that really quick, Matthew 24, 15 to 24, 15 to 21, I'm sorry, and I'm reading, you will see the awful horror of which the prophet Daniel spoke. Notice, you will see the awful horror of which the prophet Daniel spoke. So no matter when you 
believe Daniel was written, even people who claim it wasn't written until 160 BC, Jesus said the events that he prophesied are still future in Jesus' day. So you can't, you, there's no way you can, you either have to call Jesus a liar or you can't, you, you have to believe that Daniel was a prophet. It will be standing in the holy place. Note to the reader, be sure to understand what this means. Then those who are in Judea must run away to the hills. Someone who is on the roof of his house must not take the time to go down and get his belongings from the house. Someone who is in the field must not go back to get his cloak. How terrible it will be in those days for women who are pregnant um, and for mothers with little babies. Pray to God that you will not have to run away during the winter or on a Sabbath. For the trouble at that time will be far more terrible than any that there has ever been from the beginning of the world to this very day, nor will there ever be anything like it again. Now, that warning was fulfilled. The, ch the Christians who believed Jesus' words fled from Jerusalem after the first attack by the Roman armies in 66 AD. And where did they go? They went to Decapolis. They went, they established a Pella. new Christian headquarters at Pella, Pella, one of the Decapolis towns in Gentile territory where the demoniacs first testified, testified to those Gentile people. So Jesus told his disciples, think about this. He told his disciples, get in the boat. We're crossing the Sea of Galilee. It was, mostly, it was partly at night. They arrived on the other side. They had not, no idea what they were going. I mean, why, why are we going over here? What, what, what's your plan? But they had learned not to question what, what Jesus asked them to do. They only spent an hour or two there, and they were attacked by these demoniacs. Jesus did his thing. They left. And what's the result? The Jews who owned pigs were rebuked. The, the people at the, the capitalists heard about the truth. The first Gentile missionaries were sent out. The area was prepared for what was to be the future Christian headquarters. Hmm. By that one little couple hour incident. Amazing, huh? So, do you feel assured of your salvation? Can you say with confidence, I am saved? Well, let's look at a couple passages. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. The testimony is this. God has given us eternal life, and this life has its source in his Son. Whoever has the Son has this life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I'm writing this to you so that you may know that you have eternal life, you that believe in the Son of God. So, what, how, how should we interpret that? If you have Jesus Christ? Eternal life is to know the Father and the Son, John 17, yep. 3 and 4. If we do not have the salvation of Jesus in our lives, how can we share with others? I mean, that's our question in this series of lessons, right? As a while, wise old preacher once said, when I look at myself, I see no possibility of being saved. When I look at Jesus, I see no possibility of being lost. Yeah. And when we are able to speak to somebody and encourage them and we're able to lead them to Jesus, what is the result? Remember these passages? Luke 15, verse 7 and then verse 10. In the same way I tell you there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just respectable people who do not need to repent. And then 10 again, verse 10 says, in the same way I tell you, the angels of God rejoice over one sinner who repents. So, could we, could we make heaven rejoice? Yeah. Would that be a good idea? I mean, God is begging us to do it. These verses assure us that when we correctly represent Jesus Christ before others and they are attracted to the gospel, there is rejoicing in heaven. We'll look at Romans 5, 1 and 8, 1. Now that we've been put right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then 8, 1, there is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. Is it possible for someone who has once been saved and apparently been a faithful church member to fall away? 
That's a that's a tough one, isn't it? Look at Second Peter here, eighteen to twenty-two. They make proud and stupid statements and use immoral bodily lust to trap those who are just beginning to escape from among people who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of destructive habits. For a person is a slave of anything that has conquered him. If people have escaped from the corrupting forces of the world through their knowledge of our Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then again are again caught and conquered by them, such people are in a worse state at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been much better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than to know it and then turn away from the sacred command that it was given them. That was given them. By the way, this is one of the verses that uh, made Martin Luther very upset. He he said he wanted to throw out Second Peter, partly because of this verse. What it's, happened? It's, um, yeah. This once saved, always saved. Mm -hmm has uh, having friends who are not some Adventists and God, yeah, I'm sure we have plenty of them and you know it's what a false assurance uh, is they can do anything they want to kind of thing is yeah. I cannot be unsaved no one is going to snatch them out from my from my hand so <coughs> it's yeah. but they forget that no I do not lose my power of choice that's right. Yes. Always never. Have to. He'll never take on that part. The so. power to make a choice, and that's love. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And God is love. Yeah. Imagine God allowing Satan, Lucifer in those days, standing next to his throne in heaven. And I'm sure God watched his, those, those ideas and thoughts develop in his mind, that whole <coughs> sequence. And God says, I, I would, I would like, I, I, God could have just quietly eliminated him, and nobody would have known. And then to take a third of the angels with him. Yeah. Chapter twenty-nine of Great Controversy, one of the most important passages I've ever. Or, yeah. Actually, that became my paradigm fifty plus years ago. Yeah. So it's uh, very important. Give the me. chapter again. Chapter twenty-nine of Great Controversy. Yeah. Okay, look at Paul's statement, Galatians 2, 20 and 21, so that it is no longer I who live, Christ. but it is Christ who lives in me. This life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. I refuse to reject the grace of God. But if a person is put right with God through the law, it means that Christ died for nothing. Having said all of that, we need to recognize that it is still a narrow road that we are entering. Jim? And he said to them, that is Luke uh, 9, 23, and he said to them, anyone who wants to come with me must forget self, take up their cross every day and follow me. That's some of the good new translation. Now, I want, you, I want you to think about this for a moment. What did these disciples, they must have asked them, what in the world is Jesus talking about? Take up her cross? Cross? Why are we talking about crosses? We don't think about crosses. I mean, this is, what, probably a whole year or so, or close to a year before Jesus was crucified, before they knew anything about the cross. Taking up one's cross is not easy, nor is it necessarily enjoyable. We may have to give up cherished desires and lifelong habits, but when all is said and done and we have learned to live the new Christian life, the rewards far outweigh the pain. Many martyrs will tell us their stories when we get to the better land. They will make it clear that they paid the ultimate sacrifice that they could pay. But they will immediately turn to tell us, but it was all worth it because of what Christ has done for me. John 1, 12, 10, 10, 14, 27, and 1 Corinthians 1, 30. Can you think of certain times in your life when Christ has made a huge impact? You may have been a Christian at least... Uh, in name all of your life. Do you feel that you have made many sacrifices for God and the gospel? I am very happy to say that I'm a fourth generation Adventist. <clears throat> and I hope that tradition will continue in my family. Wow. Well, <clears throat> let's talk about the, the woman who had the 12 year history of bleeding. 
She managed to get close. And if you read Ellen White's story, Ellen White's explanation, that she says, this woman was far away. She had tried everything. She'd spent all her money on so-called doctors and nobody, nothing she had been able to do made any difference. So she hears about Jesus and she says, I have to get there. And I'm sure if I just get there and I'm, if, if I can talk to him and explain my problem, I'm sure he'll fix it. When she got there, she be, realized there was no way she was going to be able to talk to Jesus. The crowds were just mm, mm, jammed. So in her mind, she's thinking of, well, well, if I get close to him, well, if I could just touch his cloak. Well, this is the story of that woman. The wandering crowd, Carrie? Yes. The wandering crowd that pressed close about Christ realized no accession of vital power. But when the suffering woman put forth her hand to touch him, believing that she would be made whole, she felt the healing virtue. So in spiritual things, now wait a minute, I got it right, yeah, that's right. So in spiritual things, I... It's supposed to be a comma there. The, yeah, okay. To talk of religion in a casual way, to pray without soul hunger and living faith avails nothing. A nominal faith in Christ, which accepts him merely as the savior of the world, can never bring healing to the soul. The faith that is under salvation is not a mere intellectual assent to the truth. It is not enough to believe about Christ. We must believe in him. The only faith that will benefit us is that which embraces him as a personal savior, which appropriates his merits to ourselves. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old, that that which will be most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. We are witnesses for God as we reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. Every individual has a life distinct from all others and an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall ascend to him marked by our own individuality. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace when supported by a Christ-like life have an irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. And that's from Desire of Ages, page 347, paragraph 1. Wow. Again, a marvelous statement. Yeah. Irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. Well, think of some of the powerful witnessing stories that you might have heard at one time or another. Witnesses to the truth of the gospel. What gives those stories their power? Think of Paul and his appeal to Agrippa as recorded in Acts 27. And if you have a chance to look that over, Paul said, this is what I used to be as a Pharisee. I was, a, I was one of the leaders of the Jewish people. <laughs> then Damascus happened. The road to Damascus happened. And then uh, here I am now with chains on my arms, uh, you know, in prison because of the gospel, but I wouldn't change this condition for any of those other conditions. From where I was before, no. From being the head of the country to being in chains, no. I, I, I much prefer to be here in chains. Wow. There's such a difference between satisfaction and peace yeah. in one's life versus the hubbub that we go through each and every day. We get so used to that that we don't, uh, don't take time to understand that there is a difference. Yeah. And when we have the difference, it makes a difference. Absolutely. When we explain, for what, uh, explain what Jesus has done for us, someone might ask, but how does that affect me? Each personal testimony to the powerful effect of the gospel is a proof of what is possible. I'm going to take just a second or two and tell you my experience. I one time was invited to a cocktail party. Now, you know, as a Seventh-day Adventist, a fourth-generation Adventist, immediately I would, be, I would be inclined to say, what? No, I'm not going to go. 
But the man who was my, one of my teachers at Johns Hopkins University said, well, this is not really a cocktail party. There's going to be soft drinks, and if you want to drink water, that's fine. So because it was a group of my classmates and I was trying to get to know them, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll took my wife and we went to this party. Well, wouldn't you know it, at that, at that point, in that, class, in that Saturday night cocktail party, a young lady came up to me and asked a question, and a Bible question. She wanted to know if I had ever been a missionary, and I said, well, we'd already come back from four years in Zambia. And I explained it to her about, a little bit about the great controversy. And long time later, she said to me, you know, I had asked that question to everybody I could think of for, for seven years that I thought might have some idea about, the, uh, might have an answer, and you were the first one who gave me a reasonable answer. And that young lady ended up being a professor at one of our Adventist universities. Yeah. Amazing. You never know. Yeah. I haven't been to a cocktail party since. Maybe I should go more often. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they call Christ a wine bibber? Yeah, they did. They're associated with wine bibbers. Yes. I, yeah. I don't know that they referred to Yeah, no. They, they no he associated with wine bibbers. I didn't when giving, technical yeah, you, no, you're right. When giving our testimonies, we should avoid talking about vivid details of our sinful behaviors in the past. We should also avoid claiming all sorts of righteous actions, actions in the present. Those are things we shouldn't. That's not part of what we're talking about. We're talking about who? We're talking about Jesus. Witnessing is not intended to be easy. It might even seem like a laborious task if you are doing it just because you think you have to. But to someone who has a strong faith relationship with Jesus Christ and loves him, it will be a loving response. We need to recognize that, that if we are true Christians, we have, been we have been born again. We have enjoyed a transformative experience. Ephesians 2, 13 and 14. But now in union with Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood that is the sacrificial death of Christ. For Christ himself has brought us peace by making Jews and Gentiles one people. With his own body he broke down the wall that separated them and kept them enemies. Surrounding the temple in Jerusalem, there was a strong barrier about four and one half feet high with 13 large stone slabs in which a warning was written in both Greek and Latin telling Gentiles or any foreigners that if they proceeded beyond that wall, it was at the risk of their own risk of their lives. And if you get a chance, go to uh, oh, I usually go to Google, go to Google Images, and under Google Images, type in Jerusalem Temple Barrier, and you will see they have several of these stones that are still in existence, and there's the warning sign. You know, don't pass here if you're a Gentile. If you're not a Jew, you don't belong inside this barrier. Who put the barrier? It's the Jews. The Jews. Oh, yeah. Because Ruth who could not go through. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, no. There was a petition. Here's, here's Josephus' comment. There was a petition made of stone. Its construction was very elegant. Upon its Upon it stood pillars at equal distances from one another, declaring the law of purity, some in Greek and some in Roman letters, that no foreigner should go within that sanctuary. That's uh, what you call spreading the gospel, welcoming in people in, right? Yeah. And, and what would happen if they did? Oh, they could be killed. Yeah. They wanted to kill Paul because they thought he had, he had invited some Gentiles in. It wasn't true, but they just accused him of that. Now that's, that was the reason he was arrested. You mean they would do something like that? They would make it a false charge against somebody mm. back 2,000 years ago? <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> what, what's, nothing new today, is it? No. In effect, the Jews were saying that Gentiles had no access to the presence of God in the Jewish sanctuary. We heard a sermon recently by a very qualified young man they reminded us that that Ethiopian eunuch who came to Jerusalem, he would not have been allowed to go inside there. Not at all. 
and Boris, he, he was in, in charge of the treasury down in Ethiopia, so apparently he had money with him, probably a whole retinue of people who traveled with him, and so he said, well, at least can I get a scroll? Oh, yeah, if you're willing to pay enough money, we'll, <laughs> we'll sell you a scroll. <laughs> okay, here's the scroll, so he's on his way home, and he's trying to read this thing. It wasn't the Isaiah scroll, was it? Yeah, I said, Isaiah, or, yeah, what was, Isaiah, what was the text? Isaiah 53. Was some, I thought yeah, that's some text. He was reading Isaiah 53 yeah, when, right. yeah. And it happens to be this Isaiah scroll that they have at the book there in, in Jerusalem. Well, yeah. that, that was, that's the one they got from the Essenes. Dead, yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, yeah. so it wasn't the same one, but no, yeah, but it that's was still, it was yeah, same, same idea. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In fact, that was, I think it was Isaiah 11, 1 was uh, the, the fellow who wrote the, mm -hmm. Rabbi Zwerin wrote the, the book of the rabbi from Burbank, and that text is what the, the stump there's a root shall come out of, or shoot yeah. will come out of a uh, stump of Jesse. Yeah. And that was what, what triggered him with his communication with, with another a friend of yeah. we know. We need to absolutely believe and practice that the gospel is for everyone. Salvation is for everyone. We have talked about the changes that took place in the life of John. In his later years, John was so kind and gentle and spoke the gospel with such love that one writer has said, John wrote with his pen, dipped in love. Mm. Jim, I think you're next. Okay. Love is a heavenly attribute. The natural heart cannot originate it. This heavenly plant only flourishes where Christ reigns supreme. Where love exists, there is power and truth in the life. Love does good and nothing but good. Those who have love to bear, excuse me, those who have love bear fruit unto holiness, and in the end, everlasting life. Ellen White, Youth Instructor, January 13, 1898. It's over. Okay. Witnessing, excuse me, witnessing is not a spiritual gift given to only a very few people. It is the role of every Christian. Simply tell what Christ has done for you. Share with others the peace you have found in Jesus. Tell them how Christ gave you purpose in your life. Pray for opportunities to tell those around you the joy you have in following Jesus. Tell them how you grasped his promises by faith and found them to be true. Share answers to your prayers or Bible promises that are meaningful to you. You will be surprised at how others will respond to a faith that is genuine. If someone asked you the question, do you have eternal life? How would you respond? Would your answer be vague or uncertain? Would you say, I sure am, excuse me, I sure hope so, or I wish I knew, or am not certain? Jesus wants you to have the certainty of eternal life. The Apostle John declares that God has given us eternal life, and this is, his, excuse me, and this life is in his Son, 1 John 5:11. He then adds words too clear to be misunderstood. <clears throat> he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5, 11 to 13, New King James Version. As long as we have Jesus Christ living in our lives, the gift of eternal life is yours. Excuse me, is ours. <laughs> he is life, and in him we have life. It is his assurance that gives power to our witness. Our assurance is not based on our good works or our superior righteousness. It is based on Christ alone, who lives in our lives by the Holy Spirit producing good works through us. Adult Bible Center, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Page Some Seventh-day Adventists have been reluctant to say that they are saved because of what Ellen White wrote in Christ Object Lessons. Carrie? Never can we safely put confidence in self or feel. This side of heaven that we are secure against temptation. Those who accept the Savior, however sincere their conversion, should never be taught to say or to feel that they are saved. This is misleading. Everyone should be taught to cherish hope and faith, but even when we give ourselves to Christ and know that he accepts us, we are not beyond the reach of temptation. 
God's word declares, many shall be purified and made white and tried. That's from Daniel 12:10. Only he who endures the trial will receive the crown of life. It's from James 1, verse 12. Christ's Object Lessons, page 155 and paragraph 1. A careful analysis of that statement reveals that she was speaking in response to those who were claiming that they were once saved, always saved. <clears throat> Many have described this claim as cheap grace. But grace was never cheap. It cost the death of our Lord and Savior. But nevertheless, Charles, thank you. No, we got it all mixed up now. Do we? Yeah. So each one of you may know for yourself that you have a living Savior, that he is your helper and your God. You need not stand where you say, I do not know whether I'm saved. Do you believe in Christ as your personal Savior? If you do, then rejoice. Ellen White, General Conference, Bulletin, 1901. So how do you interpret this statement in your personal life? Yeah. 1 John 5, 12 to 13. <clears throat> whoever has the Son in his life, whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I am writing this to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. You that believe in the Son of God. Do, you have, do we have any question about God's ability to raise the righteous dead at the end? Do we have any question about God's ability to work with us in carrying the gospel to others? When once the gaze is fixed upon him, the life finds its center. Duty becomes a delight and sacrifice a pleasure. To honor Christ, to become like him, to work for him is the life's highest ambition and its greatest joy. Has that been your experience with Jesus Christ? Do you, when you have an opportunity to witness, do you really stop and think, okay, I'm now talking to someone about Jesus Christ, or are you just worried about what they'll think about you, what they might think about your church? Uh, what, what are we worried about? The only thing that really matters is what they think about God, right? Yeah. What they think about Jesus Christ. And if we are representing Jesus Christ correctly and they see it in our lives and we say something about Jesus Christ, that is what needs to happen in true witnessing. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to be your children, to claim that you have died for us and we accept it as your sacrifice and payment of our debts. Help us now to be transformed by that relationship that we have with you, each day becoming more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.